Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Sean and Christian for inviting me to this extremely interesting workshop and for organizing it. However, before starting, I have to be honest, I am not an expert at all in dance. I work on aesthetics and cognitive dynamics from an enactive perspective. So you may be wondering, what's this guy doing here? Well, I'm not sure either, but during the next half an hour, I'll try to raise some questions and maybe offer some tentative possibilities regarding dancing and aesthetic experiences that hopefully will make this time somehow worth it. Uh, during the last three years, I have conducted a project called Enamare at Kafoskaris University of Venice about the aesthetic aspect of general experience. I believe that the aesthetic is a quality of experience that is almost always, if not always, running more in the background of our engagement with the world, and that sometimes it becomes a more defined pattern of cognitive, sensory motor, and affective oscillatory. Uh, sorry and affective oscillatory processes that comes to the foreground as aesthetic experiences. The aesthetic, in other words, is always there, conditioning attentional memory and other cognitive processes, but almost never is self-evident. As a consequence, I do not consider either, as a consequence, I do not consider the aesthetic as something isolated, special, or only to be conveyed by artworks. I also believe that aesthetic experiences are neither external nor internal processes, and that we cannot speak of a unitary type of aesthetic experiences. There are multiple types of them, and they are born out of the interaction between agents and their environment. Yet, if we cannot speak of an aesthetic experience, but of different types of aesthetic experiences, is there a way to put them in contact? Do they interact? These are some of the questions I want to address today. John Dewey, in the first pages of his book, Art as Experience, made clear what his goal was. The task is to restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are work of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are universally recognized to constitute experience. I have worked on this uh, concept of this notion of continuity. Yet today I'll twist a little bit uh, to this notion of continuity. I want to explore the continuity between the performer and the audience in the specific context of dance. I'm assuming that this continuity exists and I want to explore how do dancers and audience enact a shared experience. However, I don't want to raise false expectations. I don't have, at least for the moment, definitive answers. What I'll do is analyzing concepts, frameworks, and ideas may be useful to discuss this question. So the outline of the, uh, this talk will be the following. I will start by briefly addressing one, of relevant, one relevant embodied theory of the aesthetic experience of the audience. That will be Maria Brinker's theory of the aesthetic stance. Then I will consider one recent inactive theory of the aesthetic experience of the performer, which is Sean Gallagher's double attunement framework. I will continue by presenting some aspects of three concepts used in cognitive dynamics, resonance, attunement, and rhythm. And to conclude, I will discuss the possibility of adapting the theory that I developed during my project to address the specificities of a shared aesthetic context between audience and dancers. Maria Brinker considers that whether we are at a play inspecting a museum artwork or taking in a scenic view, aesthetic experiences generally show an asymmetric relation between beholder and beheld. She suggests that this asymmetry is a hallmark of classic aesthetic experiences. In many aesthetic, in many aesthetic settings, the social and material context does not call for targeted action, but rather hold us afford us a disengagement of goal-directed action. A mutually opposing dynamic exists between a practical goal-directed attitude and a more aesthetic attitude. First of all, Brinker leaves clear in her paper that she is not trying to offer a comprehensive theory of aesthetic experience. It is not strange then that she considered 
disinterestedness as a characteristic experience, as a, as a characteristic aspect of passive, contemplative, and classic aesthetic experiences. Yet, she tries to move away from Kantian aesthetics by saying that, from her point of view, there is no emotion detachment, simply a detachment from action. That is, we are emotionally involved, but we wander and wander in front of the artwork without a clear action agenda. From Brinker's perspective, this detachment, paradoxically, promotes a receptiveness where the pause of an action allows the experience to play with our emotions, sensory motor resonance, and potentially with our memories and imagination. I think that the Brinker's theory, of which I have just mentioned one tiny aspect, is extremely interesting, but a little bit passive and too Kantian for my taste. Yet it presents many interesting aspects that can be used to assess the interaction between audience and performer from the point of view of the former. For example, the way she speaks of our allowing the experience to play with our emotions through processes such as resonance. Let's continue by considering the point of view of the performer. This perspective has not been that popular, yet recently, Sean Gallagher has been working on this aspect. Gallagher's theory of the aesthetic experience of the performer suggests that this, is, that this experience is both an attunement to the character being portrayed, the music being played, the dance being danced, and the self-awareness of the performer in the meshed cohesive gestalt of the performance itself. If this is a way of being in the flow, Gallagher says, it is a mean, mindful being in the flow, where the performer's awareness of the performance is one unified double attunement to what is happening and to how she is performing when the dynamical gestalt is cohesive. So in my own words, with this uh, small uh, diagram, I would say that the key idea is that a performer's aesthetic experience is a form of empathic uh, mindfulness developed through a process of double attunement in which the self and the other are distinguishable yet inseparable, situated within a meshed architecture that incorporates a vertical axis of minded and embodied affective processes and a horizontal axis of extended and contextual scaffolding. That way, the experience of a performer involves at least a minimal yet decisive degree of mindfulness. A performer may not be paying attention to this minimal degree of mindfulness, but there has to be the possibility of grabbing this thread, for it is the anchor that allows the performer to be aware of how she is performing and of the relation between her how she is performing and other contextual aspects that modulate her aesthetic experience. Gallagher resorts to Christensen, Saturn, and McIlwain model of mesh architecture to explain how different mindful experiences integrate with embodied and affective structures on a vertical axis that encompasses a dynamic interaction between attentive perceptual processes and motor control processes attuned to the physical and social environment. This vertical line is traversed by a horizontal one that incorporates physical, social, cultural, and normative factors involved in both rehearsing and actual performance. So now it is time to address how the aesthetic experience of the audience and the performers interact in the specific context of dance. Until now, we have seen two potential candidates, processes of resonance and processes of attunement, but what do they mean? Resonance presents several possible conceptions. The ecological notion of resonance goes back to James Gibson. According to him, instead of supposing that the brain constructs or computes the objective information from a kaleidoscopic, a kaleidoscopic inflow of sensations, we may suppose the orienting of the organs of perception is governed by the brain so that the whole system of input and output resonates to the external information. Yet, Gibson does not offer further explanation on how the brain resonates to this external information. More recently, Vicente Raja, 
in a set of papers has recovered and expanded Gibson's notion to propose that resonance is what is going on inside the organism, especially in the central nervous system with regard to what is going on at the ecological scale. Raja presents resonance as a unidirectional process in which the environment works as a guiding constraint, negative or positive, of intraorganism scales, but not the other way around. That is, resonance will take place from the environment to the organism. For a more embodied and an active point of view, Thomas Brooks and Sabine Koch have worked on the different resonant loops that take place for a human being while engaged with the environment. Just to mention one of their many interesting and relevant ideas, in the book Ecology of the Brain, Fuchs claims that mediated by the body, brain, and environment mutually resonate, mediated by the body, brain, and environment mutually resonate with one another. They are linked by dynamic isomorphic patterns of oscillations. As a result, the brain can be conceived of as an organ of resonance, the rhythmical oscillations of which continually establish a coherence between organisms and environment. In this case, resonance is no more unidirectional, yet the emphasis on isomorphic patterns required by the definition of resonance maybe makes this concept unable to apprehend all the nuances and subtle interactions that take place during experiences such as the aesthetic ones. Regarding attunement, we have to be aware that we are speaking of a term mainly used in psychology and philosophy that is often regarded as a synonym or at least very closely connected to the concept of entrainment, much more popular in physics. From an ecological point of view, Harry Heft, in his ecological psychology in context, claims that humans are fundamentally social beings attuned from the outset of life to information from social sources and social processes. However, claim it that cognitive development entails in part becoming attuned to a persisting structures of the environment by selectively engaging those structures is not to describe a process with a terminus. It is open-ended, mediating his branches and lifelong, and through their actions, individuals can create new environmental structures while they transform or eliminate through design or neglect existing ones. From an active perspective, uh, but building on ecological views of attunement, uh, Ryan and Gallagher have presently argued that it may be better to see attunement and resonance as coextensive processes, rather than suggesting that we need to replace all uses of resonance with attunement, or that the notion of self-tuning makes attunement somehow theoretically redundant. They continue by contending that it would be a mistake to think of the brain or the organism or the agent as shifting between resonance and attunement. It is instead the case that the system is often in the process of doing both. The jazz soloist we discussed above is both resonating and attuning at the same time. After all, and we see no reason why that process would be different in other areas of cognition. So for now, it seems that we could build an approach on what connects audience and a dancer during a performance by resorting to models that combine resonance and attunement. Now, returning to John Dewey, he contends that rhythm is the first characteristic of the environing world that makes possible the existence of artistic form. The rhythms of art are grounded in the basic patterns of the relation of the lived creatures and its environment. As a result, Dewey claims that rhythm is a universal scheme of existence underlying all realization of order in change. It pervades all the arts, literary, musical, and architectural, as well as the dance. Underneath the rhythm of every art and of every work of art, there lies as a substratum in the depth of the subconsciousness the basic pattern of the relations of the life creature to his environment. In other words, rhythm is the dynamic and transient rearrangement of energies during the experience of an entity or an event that renders that renders it expressive and meaningful. I have followed uh, Dewey's notion, uh, Dewey's aesthetic theory and the importance he grants to rhythm 
to propose an account of rhythm and his role in human cognition, and more specifically, in aesthetic experiences. I have to make clear that when I speak, when I speak of the rhythm of a cognitive process, this does not mean, of course, that we can register a unitary constant oscillation in the body and the brain, but that the various oscillations originated in the brain, body, and environment are nested in such a way that variations in one of these affect with mystery as a whole. These different oscillations not only serve their specific functions, they become part of an ongoing set of rhythm constraints constitutive of cognition. For there is always a multi-layer rhythm intertwining us with the world. I think that this extremely open and relational understanding of rhythm can be used to integrate uh, processes of resonance and attunement. In other words, following Dewey, rhythm will be a universal scheme of existence of life. And resonance, at least in the way uh, Vicente Raja understands it, might be a specific type of rhythm that takes place from the environment to the agent. The same situation could be could work for attunement. It could be regarded as a particular type of rhythm phenomena that takes place between different agents or an agent and an event through reciprocal and sustained interaction. Yet this is not the place to discuss these ontological and conceptual issues. What I do now is explaining what I think to be some specific aspects, aspects of this aesthetic rhythm. I suggest uh, that there are three borders that mark the transitions between non-aesthetic and sometimes of qualitatively different aesthetic experiences. There is a first threshold between non-aesthetic and minimally aesthetic experiences, a second threshold between minimally aesthetic experiences and minimally reflective aesthetic experiences, and a third, a final one, between minimally and fully reflective aesthetic experiences. By thresholds, I do not mean solid, solid and fixed borders, but relational, dynamic, and context-dependent changing limits that bring qualitative difference to the experience. I suggest that aesthetic experiences start out always as minimally aesthetic experiences and then can reach or not other subsequent stages depending on several aspects. According to these aspects, the transitions will be slowed or almost immediate. The global aesthetic rhythm thus will be then the emergent pattern that results from the processes that characterize the different stages at work in a specific aesthetic experience. Now I will go on the different thresholds, the different stages. The first threshold will be crossed when it is enacted a reciprocal constraint open to bodily and environmental influences between faster sensory motor and affected dynamics taking place at the brain regions scale and its lower attentional and narrative processes at the brain network scale. The attunement and resonance of these components to an object or event from the environment happens at the pro-reflective side of experience and draws a border that distinguishes non-aesthetic from minimally aesthetic experiences. Dewey argued in his definition of rhythm as ordered variation of manifestations of energy that variation is not only as important as order, but that variation it is an indispensable coefficient of aesthetic order. The greater the variation, the more interesting the effect, provided order is maintained. Following this idea, I see the, the pro-reflective rhythm as the dynamic at which this variation originates. This variation will be an emergent quality of the experience resulting in a reciprocal modulation at different time scales, and it is what makes an experience at least minimally aesthetic. The second threshold is characterized by the experience of perceiving being invited by an aesthetic affordance to an interaction. This invitation is extended by the mindness of the affordance, which is the consequence of the precedent reflective aesthetic rhythm. 
engaging with this affordance means that the aesthetic experience becomes at least minimally reflective. Just a few words uh, on the idea of minus. Roy Dings argues that minus, along with balance and force, is one aspect that determines whether affordances invite an action or not. Minus is the extent to which an affordance is experienced as being close to who, who I am, or more precisely, to who I take myself to be. Following this line, I suggest that we perceive aesthetic affordances as opportunities to modulate, soothe, enhance, rewrite, explore, feel, forget, or merely reflect upon aspects of the narrative self, such as memories, interests, likings, desires, or habits in a socially situated, extended, intersubjective, and embodied context. However, only in some cases, Accepting an aesthetic affordance leads to an almost immediate soothing of the underlying reflective variation. Sometimes accepting the invitation of the initial affordance makes the agent open to other affordances. And this will mark our crossing the third threshold. This third threshold is marked by the emergence of several affordances that invite us with meaningful and similar force and when engaged with them, they do not soothe the underlying tension between narrative and attentional processes. These affordances are perceived through a metastable regime. This dynamic arrangement will characterize fully reflective aesthetic experiences. In resorting to the notion of metastability, that is a dynamic regime in which a system spontaneously transitions between periods of integration and moments of segregation, I follow some ideas presented by Brinneberg and Riedbell on the role of metastability in skilled actions. According to them, this dynamic regime is what allows us to be affected by different affordances and rapidly switch to another kind of adequate activity when something in the environment changes. Metastability thus is characterized as a fluid state of quasi-equilibrium that affords both increased responsiveness to changes coming from any part of the brain-body environment system and the possibility of reacting to these changes through sensory motor and attentional shifts, partially dependent on habits and skills. Yet, there is one significant difference. In skill-demanding activities, metastability ensures the responsiveness that allows the enactment of the right sensory motor habit at the right time. But in fully reflective aesthetic experiences, metastability affords the possibility of exploring the different aesthetic affordances that we are perceiving. Beyond this exploratory aspect, the differential aspect of a metastable regime is that these spontaneous fluctuations add an element of unexpectedness to the experience. While the experience lasts, neither the evolution nor the outcome will be under our complete control. So now, how does this apply to the shared experience of audience and performers in dance? First of all, I suggest that these shared aesthetic experiences will be constrained by preliminary spatial and contextual sociocultural aspects. For example, Obviously, it's not the same a performance that takes place in a typical theater in which the stains is at one side of it, or if it takes place in a context in which the performers are surrounded by the audience. These aspects will certainly have an impact in the processes of resonance and attunement taking place between performers and audience. Focusing on reflective aspects of the continuity between aesthetic rhythms, I think that there will be an asymmetry between in the reciprocal impact between audience and performers. Following Brinker's aesthetic stance theory, we can expect that the impact of the performers on the audience will be higher than the one that might take place the other way around, or at least it will be more immediate. Certainly, the reaction of the audience will constrain the performance, but 
this might be a slower process. Arguably, the attunement of the pro-reflective side of the pro-reflective affective, sensorimotor, attentional, and narrative processes of the audience to the performance will take place through mechanisms such as affective and kinesthetic empathy. The strength and speed of these processes will depend on aspects such as their technical knowledge, attention, expectations, and previous experiences, as has been suggested by researchers such as the one by research such as the one conducted by Corinne Jola and colleagues who show how looking at other stands moves those who are watching. Another aspect to be considered is the impact of the, on the performers of their attunement to their rehearsed role. According to Gallagher, these elements should drive the performance aesthetic experience in a circumstance like the ones we are discussing. A final relevant aspect is the phenomenon of a spontaneous entrainment within the audience. Ardithia and colleagues have shown how within the audience of a theatrical performance, members of the audience sitting near each other are more likely to present increased cardiac synchrony. In my opinion, this can be translated to dance, but moreover, this phenomenon could be regarded as a mixture of entrainment to the performance and resonance between the members of the audience. All these aspects, and potentially many others, might be considered as bit by bi directional mechanisms driving the reflective aesthetic rhythm enacted between performers and audience. Moving to the minimally reflective aspects, the combination of all the previously discussed processes certainly affects that they afford certainly affects the affordances and the strength of their invitation that every member of the audience and the performers perceive during our representation. In other words, these processes will make part of a shared aesthetic rhythm that unfolds between performers and audience. At the minimally reflective level of the aesthetic rhythm, this will mean that there might be an intersection in the perceived affordances between performers and audience. For example, when members of the audience engage with individually perceived aesthetic affordances, this might affect the perceived affordances of the performer. This will mean that they partially share an affordance space. The possibility of enacting this partially shared affordance space will depend on aspects such as the relative proximity between audience and performers, the capacity of the dancers to react to the effect of their actions on the audience, and more abstract but nonetheless important circumstances such as the global atmosphere of the event. I think that this enactment of a partially shared affordance space is possible if we consider that the experience of the performers is at least minimally mindful. That is, this is necessary to consider the possibility of the reaction to the specificity of the situation. A sustained and increasingly bigger shared affordance space might lead to the enactment of a fully shared aesthetic rhythm. This will mean that both the performers and the audience perceive several affordances as a way to shape the unfolding of the system constituted by the dancers, the audience, and the whole situational context. Of course, an asymmetry between them will continue to exist. In a normal context, unless a member of the audience starts yelling or throws something at the dancers, the influence of the audience on the third field of affordances is usually weaker than the one of the performers. Yet, I think that in a fully reflective cell rhythm, it is necessary to perceive the experience as not completely under control. In terms of metastability, considering the performers, they will be halfway between Kiberstein and Ritbell model of metastable skill actions, in which the goal is to react to environmental changes through the more appropriate habit and the improvisational exploration of affordances that I think characterizes some aesthetic experiences. In this case, the exploration will be partially driven by the technique possibilities of the performer, his rehearsals, the reaction of the audience, and the interactions with other dancers. Regarding the audience, I think that the main difference between this instance of aesthetic metastability 
and the one I previously discussed, it might be an enhanced and maybe more collectively perceived sense of agency. In the case of dance, there is an added layer of kinesthetic empathy that might play a role in the stronger sense of agency. In any case, I think that dance performances present the potential to grant some specific aesthetic experiences, both to the audience and the performers, but probably the specific particularities take place more at pre-reflective levels of experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Let's all give Carlos a big hand here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Carlos, if you can unshare your screen so we can see yeah. everyone when we do our little Q&A. Great. Thank okay. you. Let's, let's give him one more hand so he can see us. <laughs> there we go. Great. OK, so as before, uh, go ahead and send me your questions, and then I will go down the, the line here. And I'll give everyone just a, a second to gather their thoughts. Uh, Sean, you can go ahead. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, Carlos, thank you uh, very much for that. It was, uh, I think, very interesting. I'm trying to understand uh, the, the notion of affordance uh, in the context of the audience, say, viewing, say, in a sta at least in a standard setting, viewing what's happening on a stage, whether it's dance or acting or what have you, the audience is, uh, is viewing that. Um, and you're describing it in some way as involving an affordance for the audience. And I'm trying to understand that, you know, uh, the, the kind of typical way of talking about affordance is to talk about action affordance. Uh, I can do something or I can interact in some way, but typically an audience doesn't interact, at least over in overt actions. So, can you say something about what you know, what that, uh, what an, what kind of affordance you're talking about there? Yeah, of course. This is a um, thank you for the question. This is very interesting. Uh, the, as you uh, well know, the, the the concept of affordance is, is very <laughs> polemical always because there are those who consider affordance in a very restrictive way, as you said, always related to actions. And there are others uh, who consider affordances in a much more open way. I think, in, for example, of uh, Giovanna's Colombetti's, uh, Giovanna Colombetti's understanding of affective affordances, uh, the notion of emotional affordances, and that, that I try to, to, to present of aesthetic affordance. I think that my understanding of aesthetic affordances is, of course, in the limit for, for people working on ecological psychology. Uh, they might consider that uh, what I refer to is not an affordance at all. But I think that, uh, that it could be interesting and useful to regard affordance uh, that way and apply it to, to aesthetic experiences, because uh, I think that there is a a transition in between reflective and reflective aspects of aesthetic experience that is marked in a change in what we perceive we can do with the experience we are having. And I, I don't think, I haven't thought, or I haven't found a better name to, to define, to, to, to conceptualize this change that we perceive in the possibilities of engaging with experience that other than affordance. For me, uh, this is an aesthetic affordance. Uh, there is people like Jesse Prince, uh, others that uh, use aesthetic experience uh, and use the notion of aesthetic affordances uh, in aesthetic experience. Uh, and I think that, uh, of course, there is plenty of work to do, that there is uh, many interesting pa potential papers trying to find out the, the relation between the different types of affordances, but I'm happy to, to, to to, to argue that the, this understanding of aesthetic affordance can be applied and can be useful to study aesthetic experience in general. Okay, great. That, that's great. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Eile, you're up. Hello. I just want to thank you so much for this paper. I, I'm a Dewey lover and scholar, and I've studied his work on rhythm. Um, and, and as much as I love Dewey, I think that his 
view of rhythm in connection with dance is connected to tribal beating of drums and, and kinds of very, very non-sophisticated kinds of rhythm. And, and rhythm can become very, very complicated, um, you know, uh, both in social dance and artistic dance, which he, he blends, you know, in thinking of the art of, of the everyday. Um, but my question for you, because this is something I really haven't come to a conclusion yet on, um, is whether there can be non-aesthetic experience. Um, I, I think that there cannot be when it comes to artistic experience for you know reasons I won't bore you with right now, but I'm, I'm wondering what you might mean by non-aesthetic experience of rhythm and whether that could happen in dance or whether it could happen at all. Because, because on my view of aesthetic, which isn't just Dewey in, um, there can be negative valences to aesthetic. There can be visceral experiences. There can be other kinds of things. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that a non-aesthetic experience exists. And I, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I, I have to say that when I speak of a non-aesthetic experience, I, I tend to think of this like an ideal point. <laughs> I, I, I don't, because I, as I said in, in the introduction of the talk, I think that there is always a minimal comp aesthetic component of the aesthetic working in experience. But I think that this, uh, this is, com this doesn't go well with uh, Dewey's ideas in the sense that he conceived this idea of the aesthetic as a phase of every uh, experience we are having and something particularly powerful and isolated and intensified in, this, in the experience afforded by our words. So for me, Dewey, as you said, uh, the, the concept of rhythm and many other concepts are sometimes a little bit raw, are so concepts that need working, but for me, they have so many potential ideas lurking <laughs> behind them. And that I, every time that I go back to, to some of Dewey's tests, not only in aesthetic experience, but in cognition in general, I'm always happy to, to, to be surprised of the potential that they retain. But the other aspect that you mentioned and the possibilities of non-aesthetic experiences and negative aesthetic experiences, I think that is there is many things to discuss under a Dewey optic and in general, because of course the possibility of a non-pleasant aesthetic experiences or negative aesthetic experiences is something that is very different to, to, to defend under a Dewey's aesthetic theory. But I think that is something that needs working and that it can be there, there is potential in, in this idea and it's something that we need to address uh, in aesthetics because we are, have a growing number of examples of uh, non-pleasant or non-classic aesthetic experiences that work under the uh, theoretical classic models of the aesthetic uh, reward, aesthetic engagement. And this is something that uh, do we uh, probably we could say that fails to, to acknowledge. I don't know if I have answered the, your question. You, you have, thank you. Okay, great. Cynthia. There we go. Um, yeah, and my question, I think, I think follows up. Well, if I understand negative aesthetics, I mean, I, I guess the question is, is implicitly here in aesthetics of beauty, um, behind um, this um, theory of resonance or affordances, or how would you deal with um, art that is uh, art of shock of queer theories, um, disidentification or a Brechtian kind of theater? Is that, um, is that, would you deal with that differently? Would it, you not be explaining that in terms of affordances? and um, attunements and so forth? Or would there be a, a way of doing, using those theories for this, for those approaches too? Thank you, thank you very much. I think that my, this is something that I discussed uh, with the supervisor of my project or while I was working on this uh, model of aesthetic experience. 
and it was something that we always had in mind, the, the, the necessity to, to be able to, to answer this, uh, as, as you say, this kind of shock experiences, these non-pleasant Brechtian theater experiences. And in the paper that I referred uh, briefly in this presentation, I, I mentioned this kind of experiences. I think that it can be somehow explained through processes of uh, resonance and attunement. But I, 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 I want to, and I have to uh, address this kind of experiences in a more specific way, because I, I feel that there has to be some particular dynamics, some maybe a bigger uh, attraction. I don't want to think that this kind of non-pleasure non and aesthetic experiences maybe require a more passivity, but they have to engage us in a more powerful way that we cannot be able to to, uh, to resist. But by resorting to the notion of uh, narrativity and mindness, I, I try to, to be able to acknowledge this, uh, these experiences because I think that something can be relevant for us from a mindless point of view. And it doesn't, have, it doesn't necessarily have to be something beautiful and pleasant. Maybe it reminds us of a shock or a but experiences we have before, or we are familiar with, or we are just interested. And this way of resounding with our interests, with our minus, our narrative processes, maybe, as I said before, the, I have to work more specifically on this, but I think I have the intuition that this can be tackled through the notions of attunement and resonance. Okay, great. I actually have uh, a question, so I'm just gonna <laughs> insert myself in the queue real quick here. Um, so you spoke about the shared field of affordances between the audience and the dancer, and I, and I take the context here that you're doing a, some, something like classic, classic performance stage dance, right? Um, you have pictures of, of ballet, for example. And, and you know, if, if we're talking about interactive dance, like uh, social dance, right? You go out and you social dance with someone. I can see how there's a shared field of affordances there, right? Now, what, what subset of affordances is it that's shared? Because certainly the affordances that the dancer on stage has is different from the affordances that's uh, present for the, for the viewer, right? I mean, the, 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 the audience can't literally perform on this or act on the same affordances as the dancer can, right? So, so what exactly is it that's, that's shared there? Yeah, I, <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is a extremely important question because this notion of shared field of affordances is something that I haven't worked on my previous paper is something that I just starting to, to, to work on now and, and it needs more refining. But I definitely think that there is, uh, there is a possibility of considering a shared field of affordances even in a more classic context. You know, when, when you are attending a performance, sometimes the, 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 there is something, something in the air, something in the ambience that you are not able to explain that it cannot be maybe uh, justify uh, by a specific theme, but it's something you perceive. It's something that you feel, and it affords you the possibility of maybe for the audience having more powerful this sense of uniqueness of this experience, this sense of belonging to something that won't be repeated in the future. And for the performers, maybe it is a way to do for them to to go one step further to try to. This is something that you work on uh, on, on your paper on aesthetic on affordances of dance and and the, and the cognitive uh, mesh architecture. And I think that when a performer has a training that allows them to go into an improvisation, this kind of affordances are more uh, are more powerful. Uh, uh, allow you to, to, to do some particular behaviors because it's something that um, if the ambience of the performance is colder, there is a bigger distance or you perceive this bigger distance as a performer with the audience, maybe you are just compelled to, to, to do what you were supposed to do. 
but if your performance or the audience is asking for something more or is this is, is this feeling there maybe you are just in another mood and um, i think that again maybe perform uh, affordance is not the the best or the clear concept but i think that through this notion of shared field of affordances or at least reciprocal field of affordances or affordance space i think that is something is a tentative way to to, to convey this idea of a reciprocal constraining between performance and audience Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, Haile, did you press the follow-up button or was that an, an accidental click? It was an accidental click. I wanted to <laughs> do something that was like an amen because I so <laughs> agree with all that. Um, and I, I wrote him some, you know, incoherent okay. ideas in the direct message, but I'm not sure who I've seen here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I think, J.D. Minas, you had a question about Nietzsche? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, it, since ap after Sabine's presentation, we assume these spatial va valences, uh, it seems that in your model uh, there is a, a hierarchical uh, relations uh, embedded and, and that reflectivity and, uh, is on the top or, or far right. Uh, so, so uh, but if we think from Nietzschean perspective, uh, it's far from that. And, and uh, there is uh, another uh, proposal, an alternative proposal that reflectivity could be detrimental and he's <laughs> showing in many ways and especially in aesthetic domain. So how would you answer to Nietzsche uh, uh, through your theory, so to say, or model? Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I have to say that uh, I have explained uh, myself very badly if this is what I convey, because I don't believe that in, there is a hierarchical order in which cognitive and reflective is upon pre-reflective. In fact, I consider that it's the other way around. This is what I intended to, to, to show when I said that there is always a pre-reflective component of aesthetic experience and the other aspects may arrive or not. I think that every aesthetic experience starts by being pre-reflective. There is no possibility for me, at least, of an aesthetic experience that starts by being something absolutely fully reflective. I think that when we realize we are having an aesthetic experience, this experience was already going on for some time. And this is an idea that instead of hierarchical, I, I like to think of these experiences as nested experiences in the sense that there is this reflective constraint and somehow sometimes it emerges a minimally reflective component and then sometimes a fully reflective. But this is nested in the sense that we cannot have a fully reflective experience without the previous stages. With this, I don't want to say that the last the fully reflective is the most important or is the biggest. I, I just want to say that it sometimes happens, but it's not necessary. What we always need is the pre-reflective states of aesthetic experience. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see a question in the queue right now, so I'm just gonna ask another one. So I really like this idea of nested aesthetic experiences. And I think you're right that there's always a minimal aesthetic element sort of pervasive in the background, right? Um, and in your talk, you mentioned that there, you get to a certain, I can't remember which phase it was, it was phase two or phase three or whatever, but <laughs> at a certain point, you start interacting with the narrative self. And I thought that was a really interesting notion. And I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that, because I want to know more about in, in what ways is the narrative self at play, let's say, if you're just watching dance, right? Um, if you've given some thoughts to that. Yeah, uh, this is something that uh, I think that the narrative aspects are already working at the reflective side, mostly um, as a consequence of the involvement of the default mode network. I think that the default mode network is very important because, you know, there's been research on the importance of the default mode network and aesthetics for a long time. But until now, the default mode network tend to be as an opposition to the attentional networks in the kind of sense that either you are attending 
or you have the default mode network. There is no possibility of uh, this two going on at the same time. But now, recently, there is very interesting research that speaks of correlations between different networks on parts of the attentional default half of the brain. So for me, this is one more time, a kind of nested interaction between attentional and narrative uh, aspects. I think that the more this reflective aspect keeps going, there is like this attentional and narrative batteries keep charging. And the moment they arrive to a certain threshold of charge, you perceive an affordance. And this minus of the affordance is like the traduction, the transformations of the narrative charts into a, in a specific minus of affordances. Maybe you are not, of course, you are not aware of the specific function in working of the default mode network, but I think that you feel the consequence of this activation of the default mode network through the minus of the aesthetic affordances. You feel it to feel them like something extremely relevant, or maybe not that extremely, but something relevant for you. And this is the kind of transition of transmission between default mode network and reflective uh, experience, this kind of through the aesthetic affordances and this mindness. Thank you. That's exactly the answer that I was looking for. So thank you. Haile, <laughs> uh, you got another question? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you can, and I, I apologize if you if you talked about this and I didn't catch it quite, um, if you can connect the, the idea of rhythm in the shared space of affordances uh, a little more to this, to these models of atten attentional and reflective aspects, um, because rhythm is one of those things that can really permeate. I mean, if, if a dancer is clunking on the stage, you, you can feel the vibrations of the music. And it's, it's, it's part of the shared space, but as you mentioned, very well, not identical between what the performer and the audience is experiencing. But I'm, I'm wondering, um, and, and you can also be aware of it in an intentional way, and it's also pre-reflective. And I, I'm wondering um, if you could just tie that in a bit more or how you think of that. I would like to tie this a little bit more, but I, I think that this, for this, of course, uh, I will have to, to, to conduct some experiments or qualitative uh, research that uh, for the moment I, I hadn't done. I have to say that the, the, the project that I conducted at, here at Venice it was almost strictly theoretical. So most of these things have been worked through at least at one maximum a neurophenomenological approach, but I haven't conducted any specific experiment. I have presented in the paper that I referred to uh, the, the a potential way of interaction between attentional and narrative models, but always in individual aesthetic experiences. I haven't done this work yet in the case of uh, this kind of shared and commonly enacted aesthetic experience. This is something uh, yet to be done. In fact, I don't know if there is a possibility to do some clear modeling of these components. I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure about it, but I think that the, the, there is this interaction between attention and narrative uh, sensory motor uh, processes. This is something that it has to be at the, at the bottom of this pre-reflective uh, kind of experiences as well. Of course, in a much more complex, in the much more complex uh, case, in the specific situation of these shared experiences, because you are subject not only to the to the rhythms and the attunement to the performers, but also to the people you are sit uh, close to, and there is a kind of multiple layers working together that generates this kind of variation of the experience. But this is a very interesting and uh, but complicated, I, I'm afraid, thing to do. <laughs> Thank you. Good. So we have time for one more question, and I think it looks like that goes to Sean. Oh, great. <laughs> I wasn't sure we had time, but uh, good. Um, it, it's actually, I want to build on something that uh, uh, Sabina uh, in, in, in the chat said, the connection here between the, the two talks in a way, uh, that uh, aesthetic experience is an important therapeutic factor in, in dance therapy. And I, I, I'm... I don't know what to say about that, except I, th I thought, well, that's, it was something I was thinking about as Carlos was actually going through his presentation that there, were, there was some connection here, but I don't know what that connection is. Maybe Sabina might, might talk about it a little bit, but I think that would be a really 
interesting topic to explore um, uh, by some of you guys. Um, I haven't, sorry, I haven't had time of reading the questions. I just realized it now of the different questions, but I absolutely think that there is many connections and many interesting things to, to develop there. Thank you, Sabine, for, <laughs> for the input. Um, I just want to say that um, in as a therapeutic factor, it's, um, yeah, it's about beauty, but it's not only about beauty. Of course, it's also about just authentic expression. So expressing mm. your anger and giving that a form. Um, so even if that seems to be ugly, of course, that's also an aesthetic expression. So that's very important that it comes from the inside and is kind of expressing something that is part of yourself, um, no matter uh, how that would be evaluated in terms of beauty afterwards, basically. Um, and um, I didn't get so far with it because there are so many definitions of aesthetic experience, actually, that um, it's really hard to get a grip on it for myself as a, you know, just a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was really happy to hear Carlos talk about um, this um, hierarchy because that made sense to me. So I'm really curious whether there's already a publication out that I could read and refer to it. Yeah, the, the, I can share it here in, in the chat in case some of you are, are interested. It has been published recently in Phenomenology and the Cognitive Science. So, but I, I agree, I don't have I don't think or I don't like to think of a precise definition of aesthetic experiences, but I like to think of this aesthetic component of experience. And of course, uh, I think that there is room for, for this idea of uh, aesthetic impact uh, on therapy, because my understanding of aesthetic experience is a kind of rewriting of the self. So. Mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. it opens uh, many possibilities in this way. I think there is a, yeah. a connection there. And um, a very important point that I would like to make also for Sean, that it's more about an active aesthetic experience of the doing of the art making. Mm. We have very little literature on that because every time I see somebody research on aesthetic experience, it's more the receptive side. So there's very, very little knowledge about this Mm, moving and then experiencing that my body moves in a beautiful way, for example. This is a totally important therapeutic factor in dance therapy. I can hear my Parkinson patients say that to me, you know. Finally, I can find my movement, my own movement beautiful again, you know, when I do the tango therapy with you guys. So this is the active side of it and there's not so much out there and I, I would be happy to any, uh, if you could point me to any literature because if anybody has read a lot of stuff and knows a lot of things, then it's Sean. So Sean, I would be really, really happy if you have anything <laughs> literature okay. you can point me to for the active side of the experience. Well, I guess I should mention I have a new book coming out. <laughs> so <laughs> just any day, Carlos, I don't know when. Carlos wrote a nice introduction to it, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's called Performance Slash Art. And it's all about the, the oh aesthetic God. experience from the performer's perspective. So that should be out any day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> See, I have to say that that I agree with you, Sabine, in the sense that we have to be able to, 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 to understand and to work on this active aspect of aesthetic experience. In fact, it is one of the reasons that I just been so... Uh, so um, I have always tried to use the, the notion of affordances in, a, in an active way. I think that for us to be able to, to, to have this fully reflective aesthetic experiences, we have to accept we have to act on the possibilities of the experience afford us. And this is something that um, is not, has not been addressed uh, maybe with the, maybe not sure, for sure, with the importance for me the, it, it requires, but Sean's book uh, in the perspective of the performance I have uh, is very, very powerful. I mean, I make very interesting points in this aspect. So I think uh, we should all give both of our speakers a big hand again, because this has been a really enriching and wonderful okay. day. Uh, thank you so much. This, this is great. Everything I ever wanted out of this.
Um, unfortunately, I can't leave the room open for very long today uh, just because I have to get on a phone call with HR. But <laughs> that's always pleasant, right? But this, this does conclude our, um, the official programming for today. And I'll see you all again tomorrow. And we'll just keep being awesome, all of us. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave it open for about five minutes or so. So if you want to chit chat. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>